Good morning, everyone. So I'm Vito Duchevi, Executive Director of uh, New Direction. As you can see with my name, I will not speaking in Spanish. I will give this uh, short introduction in English. First of all, I would like to welcome um, he in El Escorial, beautiful place. We are very happy to have this first physical event after the long and difficult time that we all uh, suffered from with the COVID situation. I think that we learned one thing with this COVID uh, pandemic. Even though we try to be innovative, to be creative, to find new tools of communication, there's nothing better than to be together and to think together. Uh, and uh, that's why we are very happy today to host this university together with Civismo. Uh, during this week, you will hear a lot from different speakers, a lot of insight uh, from the conservative and liberal movement. As you might know, New Direction is the official think tank of ECA, the conservative group in the parliament, European parliament. We are funded by the European parliament, and our main goal is to contribute to the debate, to boost the debate, to find new ideas, to think out of the box. And I hope that's what we'll do this week. You will have the unique opportunity to listen to beautiful speeches, but also to meet speakers before and after the lecture. Uh, the main goal, of course, is to set the tone for the next debate. As you might know, now in Brussels, Politicians are discussing the future of Europe. It might be the first tone of a new treaty. I think it's the moment for the right to say also what we'd like to achieve, what will be our goal, and not just leave the place to the left. And uh, today, you will hear a lot from the speakers who will set the tones, but I hope that thanks to this university and your next studies, in 15 years, you will do it. And I think that will give you this leverage. So I hope you will enjoy that. Last but not least, I would like to uh, warmly thank you, Civismo, in particular, Juan. I have to say that without you, it would have been impossible to organize that. Thank you for your help, for your support. I hope it won't be our last event, and uh, I wish you a good uh, week. Thank you. Thank you, Vitold. Um, bienvenidos todos. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'll try to, to do my best and, and speak as well in, in English. Actually, uh, Professor Schwartz uh, will also be addressing you uh, in English today. So it's our great pleasure to, to welcome you all to El Escorial in this, as Vito just said, hopefully uh, first, only first, uh, New Direction Civismo Summit University, uh, where we will explore the ideas of liberalism and conservatism from a philosophical perspective. Uh, that will be today. So we will create the framework of our conversation for this entire week, but also looking at the national uh, landscape and also the EU and global uh, sphere. Um, we will explore, as I was saying, whether or not these uh, philosophies, uh, if liberalism and conservatism are friends or foes, if they are compatible or if they are antagonistic, whether or not the future of the international liberal order, for instance, uh, will be conservative or it will not be. Uh, so we will discuss around these ideas. Uh, and also to what extent. Um, I also, of course, wanted to express my gratitude to New Direction and especially Retold uh, for their efforts, commitments, and especially in these quasi-apocalyptic times of coronavirus. Uh, and to you all, we know it's a, uh, this commitment shows also a great deal of effort you're making to, to dedicate, to devote one week of your time to, to this uh, journey we are about to, to embark on. So thank you very much. Um, and now without further introductions, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker today, Professor, Professor Pedro Schwartz. Uh, he's very well known um, to you all, I'm sure. And if not, he should. Uh, <laughs> so you, you have some catching up to do. Um, he holds a PhD in law from the Complutense University of Madrid a PhD in political science from the London School of Economics, and uh, among many other affiliations, he's a member of the Mont Pelerin Society, of which he was president from 2014 to 2016. He's also a joint scholar at Cato Institute and a member of the Royal Academy of Moral and Political Sciences. Uh, last but not least, he's also vice president and one of the founding members of Civismo, uh, so it is my great pleasure, and I couldn't be happier to, to welcome you, Professor, uh, to deliver the opening lecture. Thank you in advance, and the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, voy a hablar en inglés, 
pero quienes prefieran ver las cosas en español, les he dado un resumen en español de aquello que voy a tocar eh, y voy a seguir muy fielmente lo que he puesto aquí. Luego, a la hora del café, voy a hablar del escorial. Um, I'm going to speak in English. There's a, a, there's a summary here in English, but also in Spanish. And so, uh, <clears throat> at coffee, after lunch, we will speak of El Escorial, uh, this uh, uh, venue that is privileged, uh, this venue. And uh, we have to speak of the two kings who tried to build a united Europe. Charles V, the Emperor of Germany, the Emperor of, um, of Europe, and Philip II, who also fought many wars to try and have a united Catholic Europe. But we'll leave that for lunchtime, for after lunchtime. <coughs> Now I'm going to speak about virtues. My gosh, it's uh, not an easy topic, and not an easy topic for us who are liberals. Uh, can we reduce liberalism to a framework? Can we say that either liberalism is pure toleration, that's all you need to be a liberal, or also liberalism is a rational political, political thought, political ideology, and I'm going to criticize both things and speak of uh, liberalism as a framework that is an ethics, and within that ethics I'm going to say something about morality. I'm going to distinguish the two, ethics and morality. And this is, I think, the way that I see liberalism. I've been defending liberalism for quite some time, as you can imagine. And, uh, and still, I think we, we haven't finished thinking out the philosophy of liberalism. So I will start with liberalism as an incomplete ethics. Now, that is surprising. Uh, is it true that those of us who are liberals, who are going to become liberals, <laughs> or are going to cultivate this philosophy, uh, have, are cultivating something that is incomplete, that is not enough for, to lead our lives. It's not enough of a direction for us to organize our personal lives our lives in family, and our lives as parents, future parents, I'm sure, future parents of uh, a good many liberal children. <laughs> so we are going to discuss first what I think is incomplete about liberalism. And the first one, and this is something that many people say, liberalism is toleration. You tolerate anything don't respect it necessarily, but you tolerate. And living in a society where different views of, of life, different views of politics and of economics are tolerated. And if you're a liberal, you don't grab your pistol when you hear the word, uh, the word society and try to uh, rid it of the people who don't believe like you, you're, toler you're tolerant. But this isn't enough. Tolerating isn't uh, what we think of. You can't organize your life uh, tolerating everything and being a tolerant of anything that comes along. First, because it may be destructive of liberalism. If you tolerate anti-liberals and don't fight him with thought, with word, with politics, and I hope never with arms, unless we define, we defend liberalism, uh, I don't think we have much future. So what we are doing is, uh, what, what people, when they, people say that liberalism is toleration, it certainly is not enough, not enough in my view. <coughs> in fact, liberalism was born many, uh, and democracy was born many centuries ago um, in uh, classical Greece, um, and then It's gone through different forms, but when it really started to triumph in Europe 
was with romanticism. Romanticism as a view of life, of you being, uh, you being led by your heart, led by your feelings, and not necessarily by your thought. So romanticism, let's say, around 1800 to up to 1850, was a romantic view of people doing as they felt, people uh, doing as they will, and no uh, a, a liberal romantic is Lord Byron, for example, who lived an interesting life, I should say, and, uh, and one where he was led by his feelings, led by his instincts, rather than by thought. So, uh, do we want to define liberalism as pure toleration, as pure romantic impulse? I don't think so. So this is one thing that I'm going to criticize. Now, uh, later, before this romantic period, let's say with Immanuel Kant, and after the romantic period in the second half of the, sec of the, of the 19th century, we have another view of liberalism. liberalism. Uh, it's mainly the, the view of uh, uh, the view of the people who who were <coughs> the people who, uh, who were enlightened in the period of the enlightenment which uh, comes i should say from the beginning of the 18th century uh, till after the french revolution the period of enlightenment is another way of looking at liberalism liberalism as a rational idea as the reign of reason. And this is again something I'm going to criticize. Because the view of reason as something we all have in ourselves when we are not led by our passions or by our interest. And we look at, so at, at uh, society and ourselves as led by thought, criticism and reason is again, uh, is again insufficient for what I feel is, I think is liberalism. Uh, under uh, under the, the time of, uh, of uh, enlightenment, there was a, rem uh, a rational tradition within liberalism. And there's a most important essay that you have to read, and I say have to read if you're interested in this, and that is Hayek's individualism true and false which he wrote which he spoke uh, in 1945 and there he distinguishes between two traditions of liberal thought true and false false was the belief that every one of us has reason and we have to lead our life <coughs> through rational thought now, what Hayek said is that reason is born in society uh, at the same time as we try to understand things. Reason is not something in, uh, in heaven that um, discusses how society should be managed and other things. Uh, reason is something we are not gifted with. It evolves with our society. It evolves with us. On the other hand, the continental enlightened people thought that reason was out there and told us how to function and how to organize society. Uh, this dif difference that Hayek makes is between liberalism in the, in the Scottish and English tradition and later in the American tradition and liberalism as the, uh, on the continent as a product of reason. Now, I would like to distinguish between reason and intelligence. Reason is a social, a social institution, the institution of criticism, of open criticism, which is not within ourselves we tend to not to be critical of ourselves and our ideas, 
to defend them over anybody. Now, what we live is, if we live in a, in, in a, in a society that is, uh, uh, that is liberal, uh, a society that is civilized, then we take part in, uh, we accept and also use criticism, critical rationalism. Criticism is very disagreeable. I don't like it when people criticize me. <laughs> and uh, I would like to everybody to say, uh, yes, Buana, you're right in everything you say. But if I live in a society that is civilized, I accept criticism. Uh, if I don't welcome, even if I don't welcome it. And I criticize other people. Reason is the institution of critical rationalism, of criticizing so that we try and find or get nearer truth, and especially if we try and sponge error. The amount of error is much greater than the amount of true propositions. In fact, true propositions are very difficult to find. And what we have to do is to eradicate error through criticism. And that's what uh, what Hayek saw as the essence of the Scottish and English kind of liberalism. Not up the absolute reign of reason, but uh, a way of people talking, speaking to each other. Uh, liberalism and this view of, of, of a liberal society is based on conversation, on observation, so as to expunge error and to try and get nearer truth, but getting near truth is jolly difficult. And uh, we try to do it, but um, I don't know if we get near at all, a little bit nearer uh, after we criticize people. So the first point is, for me, liberalism is not pure toleration. Do as you will, and we don't care what you do. It isn't that at all. And also, it is not the reign of reason. It's, we have to find a place for virtues within our view of the world. And I put an example, always, to try and show how liberalism and the defense of freedom and the defense of, of discussion and of criticism is not enough. Why did the cap captain of the Titanic go down with the ship? Why should he? Did he do anything good for anybody? Did he make people more happy? Perhaps some people who were angry at the way he, he conducted his ship. But what he did was uh, to try and be honorable. Uh, is that because he saw life as discussion and as tolerance? He wasn't being tolerant and people would not be tolerant with him. He went there because he was proud. And pride, and pride in what is good, is something that is a virtue, and not a virtue that so many people have. So whenever people say liberalism, or freedom of thought and so on, is, is pure tolerance, no. There must be a part in life that is led not by tolerance, but by self-respect. In Spanish, we use... Uh, bullfighting metaphors, and we call that vergüenza torera, the shame that a bullfighter has to do the, as well, even risking his life. And vergüenza torera is not within liberal. You, you try to be, people try to, to, uh, uh, to praise you. People try, in fact, pay, for, pay to see you bullfight. And again, as with the captain of, of uh, the Titanic, we think that is the honorable thing to go down with your ship. Not for anybody's good, not for the happiness of anybody, but because it's the right thing to do. So I think that uh, we, what I'm saying with these examples is that being a liberal is not enough. 
that being a liberal and accepting criticism, criticizing other people, using your language in a straight way, and not to confuse people, as language is often used in politics or within the family, to lie, whatever. No, this is necessary. But we need something more to lead a good life. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to separate, uh, to distinguish between what is right and what is good. And liberalism belongs to what is right. What is good has to be added to our, the way of our life. So uh, Adam Smith didn't only write uh, The Wealth of Nations. He also wrote uh, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, a book which he corrected much more often than The Wealth of Nations. In fact, he was correcting the last edition, the year of his death. Uh, it's a book that he published in 1759, but then he went on to, to publish it uh, near, near his death. And uh, it's a book, it's the greatest uh, ethical treatise of the, 19, of the 18th century. And if anybody of you hasn't read it, well, will you please correct that immediately? Because it really gives you a different view of what Adam Smith was saying. In economics, you needed a framework, a framework where the market worked. And the virtues you need to work in the market are different from those you need in family or your personal life. It is in the, in the theory of moral sentiments where he speaks of morality and it tallies with what he has to say about economic and market freedom. And you cannot understand, Adam Smith, you cannot understand market freedom unless you also have a good theory of morality. And this is a theory that you will find in the, uh, in the theory of moral sentiments, a uh, very special view of how we get near morality. And special, but I'm not going to speak about this book. I'm going to say that clearly, in Adam Smith, you have one book about the market and the other book about, ethic, uh, about morality. And he didn't think you had enough with a book about the free market. You needed also a book that told you how to lead a good life, which is different from uh, reading or doing what is right. The rightful life is not the same as the good life. So uh, I find that li liberalism, uh, uh, to put it in another way, this is a phrase of Mill, John Stuart Mill, uh, the utilitarian, special utilitarian. John Stuart Mill wrote a famous book on freedom, on liberty, on liberty. And that book is mainly about freedom of thought, freedom of expression, uh, association, all the framework that you need to, within it, lead a good life. And so, in it, he, he uh, in it and in another book called Utilitarianism, he uh, wrote about his master, his teacher, Jeremy Bentham, and Jeremy Bentham said that morality was led by happiness and unhappiness. People looked for pleasure and, looked and tried to avoid pain. And this was enough to build not only morality, but also to, uh, to, uh, to uh, study not only morality, but also the law. He wrote, uh, if I have it here, I think so, yes. The greatest happiness, each person, it's the greatest happiness of the greatest number, each person counting for one, was the litmus test of good morality and good law. And Mill went further than that. And he asked himself about different qualities of pleasure and pain. And he said, I prefer to be Socrates dissatisfied rather than a pig 
satisfied. And this is a phrase that really puts Bentham within the framework where he is, which is an attempt, which I don't think I agree with totally, an attempt to try and explain the law, but not explain morality. The law is the framework within which what we, what we do is uh, uh, try to have the conditions within which we can tr look for truth, within which we can look for a good life, but not the summary of the good life. Please come in. Adelante. Sit yourself comfortably. Okay. So, <coughs> I think that the liberal ethics deals with rights, with formal or negative rights, rights that mark the frontier that others cannot cross and fixes the limit of what we can do to others. That, but that's not enough. That's not enough to lead a good life. And this is my point in this lecture. So, liberalism principally defines a formal ethical framework within which moral virtues can flourish. The essence of what I'm going to say today. And I know that uh, many people here, or many people in Spain and, and here, are good Christians, and uh, some, some of you good Catholics, and sometimes there seems to be a contradiction between liberalism and Christianity because Christianity is not about the framework, the, lib the free framework we need uh, so that people don't come and push us around in our lives and uh, people, and I don't abuse or push people around myself. Within this framework, we can follow different moralities and one of them <coughs> is certainly Christianity and others, where, which is not Christianity but also trying to lead a good life. And so, one of my conclusions of what I want to say is that you people who perhaps are good Christians and good Catholics, you needn't feel that liberalism goes against your beliefs. It is on another plane. And that different plane, I think, is important to lead the good life. Now, we mustn't be idealistic or rather silly by thinking that we humans are naturally good, uh, as uh, Rousseau seemed to think. We are naturally good and society corrupts us. Uh, instead of thinking we are naturally rather bad and uh, the framework we're going to build allows us to get away from uh, uh, lack of virtue, from bad acts, allows us to, because it, li it states a limit to what we can do to others and for what others can do to us. And so uh, we have to understand what human nature it is. And I mentioned there, and you have it in the references, an article by Brunner and Meckling. I both knew them, and they were special on monetary theory, uh, which is the, the book I'm writing now on money and monetary theory. As you can see, money has become both the hope and the uh, danger that we lead in our Western society. So, people, we people are resourceful, minimizing, opportunistic. And if we are within a system, we try to get it to move in our way and in fact lie and cheat if possible. Um, we've seen that during the, the COVID, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic where yeah, well, we, we may have been very good citizens but we tried to cheat in our, uh, towards us and certainly governments have cheated and shown that they are, that they are ignorant. Anyhow, what we have here is what Adam Smith said in his uh, The Wealth of Nations, a very important phrase, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher 
the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interests. Uh, I've written self-interest, but no, it's interest. And this phrase shows that in the market we are moved by other things than by the good. We are moved by playing the right role within the market, not cheating, not lying, trying to get on and become rich, and also uh, to try and keep, keep our contracts, work hard, and have the kind of reliability that we need in the market for people to, uh, to work with you. That is one bit. But those are not all the virtues. The virtues are maybe others, and they have to be defined by all of us or by, by our society. Uh, those virtues. So he, he, Adam Smith, was no sucker. He, he knew how we were and he knew that we are looking for our interest. And the question of liberalism is how to frame and limit our interest so that we don't cheat, so that we don't harm other people. And so you can be, uh, you can have the kind of framework you need for a free market. Uh, it's Curious how, uh, from, uh, from sociologists we have this, how people in the United States tend to trust others. Trusting is jolly important for the market to work. There was a time when you shook hands and that was a contract. And you knew people were going to keep to it. And, and so uh, this is the kind of world within which we have societies get better, get richer. Uh, you keep your contracts, you keep your word, uh, you respect the property of others, um, and you try to work as hard as you can. In fact, the kind of persons we are is different from the kind of person we could be if we were, if our parents were millionaires and we were millionaires had no need to work uh, and had no need to have people's trust in you and keep your word um, and keep your, your time, which I, being a Spaniard, I'm not so good at, but still to be punctual and all of these things we, we have as market virtues and those are different from the ones I'm studying today. And so, we are better people because we have to work. And not having to work, getting an income from the state, whether you work or not, as people are, su are suggesting now, that the, the way to have a good society is to have a minimum income for everyone, whether they work or not. Well, that will give us a kind of humanity which we don't like, because it's a humanity that in the end will be corrupt and will, uh, they say it's because with that sort of income, artists will be able to pursue their art. Artists usually are hungry and uh, they, uh, they have to, to write their poetry, they have uh, to, uh, to try and write it and still get some money somewhere. And uh, so people who are hungry and want to, to get somewhere are different from the people who just loll in an easy life because the state will give them an income, a minimum income, which is being done for the unemployed and other people which, for which we could discuss today. But what it, the proposal is to give everyone a minimum income. And I think the kind of society we're going to have is no good. It's a society of people who are capricious and confuse liberalism with do as you will. Now, so knowing that human nature is, uh, how can I say, we're really corrupt in many ways. We look for our interest. We try to get a free lunch, if we can have it from other people. We try to uh, build a democracy where only one-fourth pay income tax, net income, net income tax. They, 
the others pay tax, perhaps, VAT and so on, uh, not income tax, but VAT, and those people then get <laughs> all sorts of handouts from society. And so democracy can go that way, to have the majority vote for the minority to pay, for the minority to bear the burden. And that's not very good for democracy. It corrupts democracy. Uh, we could discuss it another day, not today. But certainly, the fact that the majority can press on the rich, the rich will pay. The rich, in the end, means the middle classes also. The rich will pay, and so we have a right to house, uh, home, we have a right to work, we have a right to enjoy ourselves. Uh, that is what we want to have. And that's not the kind on which, you, on which you can build democracy. When the vote of the majority tries to exploit the minority. And this is what we hear in so many places. And I think we should uh, resist that kind of thought. So, what Adam Smith said is, I will base my morality not so much on getting rich, which is important for him, and he says rich people are admired, doesn't like it much, but still rich people are admired, and so people try to get rich and get on in society and all that sort of thing, bettering your own condition, he calls it. But he also says the first phrase in the theory of moral sentiments, is very different from what people think about him. Uh, whosoever man may be supposed... No, whatsoever, whosoever man may be supposed to be, there are, every, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. So that's what he called sympathy. We feel with other people. The whole book is written on this. We feel with other people. Not only do we have to be right and make a fortune and get on with our work and so on, we also have to pay attention to that feeling for other people and act on it. More for people who are in our family, near us, less for the hungry in China or in India, but still, we do feel for our people. When there's a catastrophe, an, uh, an earthquake, uh, Span Spaniards give a lot of money. Many people give a lot of money. So that uh, you better the condition of those who have suffered. But this is a bit remote. So we have the two principles to, to get on in life and to build on the sympathy that we feel. In fact, what he says that in a well-educated society, people have an inner spectator who will tell you whether you uh, are doing the right thing or not. And uh, that is the complement to the wealth of nations. All right, so what I, want to, what I want to insist on is the difference between right, what is right, and what is good. On the upper level, meta rules, I call it meta rules because they're rules that are above or beyond the rules that we, what, that we use in our personal lives. Meta rules are fixed or are fixed and define the minimum correct behavior that marks the space within which individuals can do what each of them think is good. Here's the difference between right and good. We have, on the upper level, what is right. And these rules are fixed that define the minimum correct behavior that marks the space within which individuals can do what each of us, each of them, think is good. So we have the rules of respect for for our word, uh, respect of private property, and uh, 
contracts that we have to perform. Um, I must say that writers and thinkers are very bad at performing contracts. You sign a contract saying, I will hand in this book uh, next February, and it usually is a, a year late. Um, that's the way, the, the bad discipline that we have, because nobody expects it for If they took us to court, then we would be a bit more attentive to what we have promised. So here we have, on the upper level, the meta rules that define the minimum correct behavior. But those are not virtues, they are things we've learned socially. And then what we have, uh, this is a framework that must guarantee the dignity of each person, his property rights, his liberty of thought and expression, freedom of association, all the fundamental human rights that we've been evolving slowly. Um, I I've, have studied at the time of slavery, when the Spanish crown under the Bourbons in the 18th century decided to purchase slaves <coughs> because Indians were not up, didn't have the force to work in the mines. Those slaves, of course, were purchased from black sultans in Africa who sold the people they caught and sold them to the Portuguese and the Spanish and they were taken to America, to Brazil, and taken to uh, the Spanish-speaking America. And that was, many people thought that was normal uh, because the poor Indians died in the mines. Um, in fact, Spain for a time uh, had uh, what is called the Dutch disease. The Dutch disease is when a country has so much productivity in one good that uh, all the others they have to import and the balance of payment is uh, all financed by this one good. In the case of the Dutch, it was gas that they got from under the earth. In the case of the Spanish, it was silver. In fact, usually the Dutch disease is based on a technological advance. In the case of Spain, the silver they got was m made easier to obtain by um, breaking, the, uh, uh, breaking the mineral. The mineral was, uh, was made of silver and was of, of, uh, made of silver and sulfur. And so what you did is break it up and use mercury to displace uh, the silver from the sulfur and then be able to use that to coin. So what we have here is the poor Indians died in the, in the uh, mercury mines. It's well known today, it's a poison. Uh, it was called the death mine. So what, what you had there in different times, you had different rules for how the market worked. And people thought then that they could purchase people, purchase from the black kings of Africa the black kings of Africa, I know this is incorrect, but they did that. They took people and sent them over uh, for guns and for different goods that they purchased from the Spanish and the Portuguese. So what we, what we need here is, uh, is, rules, is rules that we, you miss the best, is rules that we, that uh, we have, and those rules have changed, and they are changing all the time, mainly spontaneously from the working of the market. Also, because of the feeling of what is right by groups of people. In fact, <coughs> the uh, transport of black people from Africa to America was stopped by the British Parliament, thanks to a group of Protestant uh, churchmen who thought it was wrong. So what you have is slowly the, uh, what is right changes over time. Now we have what to discuss what is good. So uh, the virtues at the concrete level, norms of human flourishing can be found. 
And those norms of fear, human flourishing are very different from many of us. Be, you try to be a good teacher. Uh, I tried to be a good teacher uh, at, in my years at university, and other people will try to be good parents, uh, good sons and daughters. Uh, and that is different from being a good teacher, because if you lecture your children, they get fed up with you. And it's not the same to being in a classroom and to be in a, fa in a family. And the same, you try to be good in other ways. If you, are, if you are an artist, you try to be the best painter. If you are an actor, try also not only to get recognition, which, which is something that is self-regarding, but also to work on the sympathy for other people and also on the principle of excellence. Excellence doesn't fit very well within liberalism. Of course, in the market, if you're very good, you sell more and you get rich. But excellence of the kind we've seen with the captain of the Titanic, he said, why, why do you want to die? What good does it do to anyone? It's my honor. And I will follow the dictates of my honor. I remember there was something like four or five years ago, a ship led by an Italian uh, that was sunk in, uh, in an Italian port, and the captain ran away and uh, left the people to fend for themselves within that ship. And when they asked him, why have you run away? The phrase in Italian is, era molto buio. It was very dark within the ship because the electricity failed. Era molto buio. And I find that the contrary phrase to what the Titanic did. And what about the orchestra on the Titanic, who went on playing until the ship, ship sunk? And that is usually put as people who, who were thoughtless and went on playing as if nothing was happened. Wasn't that? It was their profession, and they were proud until the end. And that is something different from following the market. In fact, the captain could have been a good captain of another ship. So here we have, I'm going to give some examples of the kind of self-interest and respect for virtue that you have in different ways to show that these can clash, are different from different people. So on the, on the plane of morality, you don't have the general absolute rules that you have on the plane of what is right of liberalism. You have different moralities. I have that at the end of my notes. The life plan of a bullfighter looks for triumph through perfection. And that perfect, perfection of his art. And of course, he wants to be uh, recognized and perhaps in the opera Carmen, Toreador, uh, the, the, the crowd will will clap, will applaud him. But what he wants, the main thing, is to do right, to do, to do good. That is, to be good at his profession. Another one is a judge. A judge does a very different kind of job from a bullfighter. And it's not, not to, to do with liberalism. Uh, within the framework of a free market, uh, and applying the rules that a free market needs, the judge will try in his conscience to, uh, to have uh, good, just sentences. Then you have the ambition of a scientist. Now, a scientist will want to get, a uh, good scientist will want to get the Nobel Prize, and, uh, and of course the recognition of her peers, but principally, the scientists will be moved by trying to discover truth. Some scientists cheat and uh, say that they've done an experiment which doesn't work. And then when they, they are discovered, the whole profession will jump on him because the rule, the virtue of a scientist is to try and find the truth as she can. 
Then you have another kind of virtue, the efforts of the businessman. The businessman who wants to make money. Oh, wanting to make money is not, uh, is not moral. What do you mean it's not moral? It's according to his profession. Uh, a, uh, a businessman or businesswoman will have to develop his family firm and uh, be rich. And then if she is rich, will try to, uh, uh, to be a good patron of the arts or of new direction uh, or of civismo. We live from the, pat the patronage of people who are rich. We try to find them so that they convince them that not only do they have to be rich and, and be good shots uh, when they go out in the country, uh, but also that they have to defend. I tell them what interests you, which is a respect for private property. But more than that, we want, they want to be well thought of. They want to be dignified. Dignity in helping what they think is good. Are you taking notes of what I'm saying on the telephone? <laughs> that, that's what I used to do when I was a teacher. <laughs> I say, stop that. <laughs> and get, and uh, try to get what I'm saying. So then you have the self-denial of a missionary. Well, Mother Ther Teresa, she did something silly, which is to help people to die. What for? What for? What did she get there? Of course, to save her soul, but also simply to help people who were in the streets and dying in India. What moves, moved her was a virtue which is different from what a businessman. And it was a different thing. But still, that's why I say, virtues clash. Each one of us has a plan for life, and that plan tells us what we should be good at, excellent at. And then even politicians, politician who wants to win elections so as to leave a mark on his, uh, on his country and his history. Well, uh, many people speak of Churchill, uh, who, uh, who at some time was a liberal in the sense of being a liberal social democrat, with Asquith. And uh, I think his ideas about uh, how to organize society were not the right thing. Uh, and in fact, for a long time, the conservatives in England simply prolonged the welfare state. Uh, we had to wait for Mrs. Thatcher to give a turn to that big ship of the state in, in, the, in the UK. Now, he had this story, which I, some, when I'm among friends, I criticize. But what he did was to defend freedom against, first against Hitler, and then also, by speaking of the Iron Wall, against communism. So that may redeem small, the small defects that he had as a politician. <coughs> Did he want to be adored? Did he want to be um, respected? Yes, but what he wanted was to save the freedom of his country. And that's a different story. He could have said, well, let's get, sit down with Hitler and see what we can do to avoid war. But <laughs> that's not what he, what he did. And that's not the virtue he cultivated at the end of his life. All these personal moralities are at bottom incomparable. Each one follows his or her uh, idea of what is good. And we have to cultivate specific virtues to where we are in life or where we want to be in life. So, to sum up what I've been telling you here is that to be a good liberal is not enough. Uh, it will tell us what not to do in the sense of respecting the negative liberty of other people and hoping they will respect us. Not that they'll give us welfare or give us free money or whatever. 
or a free home, a free house, and all the things that people ask as of right. Right? Against whom? Who's going to pay for that? Oh, oh the rich would pay for that. And that is not what, what we want. It's the negative freedom means don't do to us what you want to do, and I won't do it to other people. I will respect them, I will discuss with them, I will not twist words, which is the, today's uh, great defect of public life, that they take words to mean what they don't mean, and so as to confuse people and uh, make them vote for what they shouldn't vote. And uh, it's, it's, that is the negative liberty, not positive liberty of <coughs> how to make people happy, no, it's how to stop people from interfering with, with what is your plan, your life plan. And then you distinguish that what is right from what is good. And what is good is different from each one of us. And being failed people as we are, humans, we are sure not to be good all the time. The cabby, the taxi man who came, brought me here, said, what a terrible society it would be if everyone was perfect. It would be absolutely dreadful. We, we try, he said, I try to, to work as hard as possible so that I have a good retirement and I can pay for my, the needs of my wife who's, who has an illness. Uh, that's, that's what moves me and uh, not, um, not the... Not, it's asking people not to interfere with you. Take my taxi away. Careful. The changes in the prices of the market sometimes <coughs> look as if a, a burglar had come to you and is taking your work away. It isn't that. We have to respect prices because they tell us what society wants from us. We will be rich normally if we do what people what demand uh, what the demand is there for. Um, why, shouldn't, why shouldn't the professor make as much money as, as a footballer? It's un unfair. It's unfair. We do a much better job. They simply kick a ball. No, they, what they do is they try to satisfy the demand of people. And that is something we have to accept because we're in the market. And we can't interfere, in a way, by putting very high taxes on people who make more money than us. We usually want to be equal to the people above us, but not to the people below us. Uh, because, well, we, we have to have what is right stop us from that kind of inclination. But we also have to find, to remember, that doing what is good is different for each one of us. Well, that's why we need a liberal society, so that you let people do what they think is good and work hard for them. But there are two different things. One is liberty, the other is virtue. And that's what I've tried to tell you and try to put it in use so that you avoid the idea that it's enough to be tolerant or the idea but the way I work is because reason tells me. I think that at all. We, the way I function with my virtues that are different from other people, that's why I need a liberal society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, so it's now opened the Q&A uh, part of this session. Uh, so this gentleman over there uh, will pass along uh, microphones so that you can ask your questions. Oh, I, I need a pen. I have a pen. I okay. have. Okay. But if I may, Professor, perhaps I could um, ask you uh, first or do two brief follow-ups, if that's okay. We have plenty of time uh, before lunch. So they think that my public is timid. And we're not asked questions, I'm sure they will. Uh, I'm sure they will. Uh, while they uh, prepare some, uh, le let me ask you this. So uh, you mentioned that the states, th that we should distinguish between what is right and what is good. 
uh, and said that liberalism belongs to the former. Uh, so I was meaning to ask you, so what about uh, teleological liberalism? So what do you make of a more perfectionistic account of uh, liberalism but as compared to, to the ontological uh, defense of it? Which leads us to, th this perfectionistic account leads us to also the question of the so-called liberal neutrality. Which liberal? Liberal neutrality, oh. which in the uh, uh, Gay Pride Month uh, is, is worth uh, mentioning, I think. Um, perfection, perfection is liberalism. Uh, uh, what theory do you have about liberalism when you, the people who say that, perfection is liberalism? For instance, the pursuit of, as Joseph Rass would put it, the pursuit of what is good and not necessarily what is right. So it would give priority to the, uh, the idea or one or several conceptions about the good life, in this case, li so-called liberal conceptions about the good life, and not give priority to the right over the good, as you put it. The conception... Uh, of the good life is, as I said, uh, not to do with the framework. And when you say there's a just price and the price ought to be decided by authority, you're invading with your idea of the good, you're invading the framework of freedom. And that is a mistake mainly because your idea of the good may be wrong. And in the case of prices, in the case of interest, uh, many friars uh, in this time and uh, also friars in, and the king in uh, this palace thought that uh, they knew what the good price was. That's an invasion. In, in fact, the king borrowed at an interest, huge interest, could come up to 12.5%. Uh, interest on what the money he needed to fight his wars. But then the friars around him said charging interest was wrong, except if the prince did it. And so perfectionist liberal, liberalism is if the friars and the prince tell us what is good, uh, what is right, I'm sorry, what is right in a liberal society. And that is the separation I want to make. No invasion of my idea of the good in the framework of freedom. Perfect. Also, um, I wanted to ask you about the communitarian critique uh, or compliment, the, uh, the communitarian critique, yeah. namely that of Michael Sandel to, to liberalism, because your critique of liberalism as pure reason, borrowing Kant's words, uh, is based on virtue uh, to some extent. Um, and what one could make the argument, I think, as it is often made, actually, that virtue can only flourish within a community. Um, so you need community, uh, that this critic would, would say, to, to live this um, noble and honorable life, as Seneca would put it. So what do you make of, of the importance of community? Well, uh, communitarianism is a philosophy and you've mentioned Sandor, and you have many others that have tried to say, confusing the distinction between what is a framework and what is a good life. And in fact, I haven't mentioned it, but I was reading these people well, yesterday when I was uh, writing this, because again, they confuse, they mix what shouldn't be mixed. So we have to defend ourselves from the idea that if you're a liberal, you're corrupt. If you're a liberal, you sin. If you're liberal, you, you go against your community. Well, I've given some examples of the good life that people lead in, in society. Some of them, some of us, don't lead anything of the sort, but there, there you are. We try, as the cabby, the taxi cab uh, said, we, we do as best we can. Uh, and so, in the case of this, it's, community, it's the community who gives us, who buys our paintings, who listens to our music, who watches us play football or tennis, as I was watching the other day, because I'm a Federer man and not a Ladalma. 
and because Federer on top of it is a gentleman, which makes him more attractive to me. Um, and so what you, what you have is, yes, you need virtue to lead an honorable life. And the captain of the Titanic was obviously cultivating virtue, but he was able to do it on a private ship uh, which, he, which he had not led properly, as uh, he was told to get away from the ice blocks and so on. So, yes, you need a virtuous life, but that shouldn't be, it shouldn't limit you from freedom, from leading the kind of life you want, not a tribal life, not a life of, of uh, obedience, but a life where you decide. In fact, <clears throat> you have different, def def different theories of, of, uh, of liberty, of a free society. One is negative liberty. Don't, med don't meddle with me, and I won't meddle with you, and I'll respect your rights, I'll respect your property, and your contracts. That's what. Then you have positive life. How can uh, Amartya Sen who was my teacher at the London School of Economics, and he ended his lectures, Pedro, you don't agree with me, do you? I said, no, no, Professor Sen. So uh, Amartya Sen says, how can you be free if you don't eat? Well, precisely the poor need it. The downtrodden women need it, need to have their rights of freedom respected in some Mohammedan countries. It's precisely the, the poor who will be trodden down by the rich or by your, uh, your aristocracy that need that defense. It's precisely the poor who need the negative life, the negative freedom. And then you have the great defect of today's world, national freedom. You, to be free, you need to be within a nation where you can tell people what language to speak. Right? You tell them, I'll, I'll use public schools to make you believe in my history and my language. And that is not negative freedom, which is the one we want. So you have different theories of freedom. From, from, listen to me, I'm not speaking of definitions of freedom. Definitions about words. Now, it's a theory of how society should be organized. And I want it organized by negative freedom, that is, rights to resist people from coming in to me uh, and, and telling me how to live, and also where I can follow the good, I can follow the virtue as I believe it, as long as I, my virtue is not stepping down on you. Thank you, Professor. Um, are there any questions? Anna, if is that what you call First, uh, I wanted to say thank you for your words and the session. They were quite interesting. And I wanted to ask a question about Christianity. You told us that liberalism sets an ethical framework in which Christianity and Catholicism could be developed and practiced. How does liberalism relate to the social doctrine of the church? To, or to what, what? Social doctrine of the church. You and find me skeptical. Yeah, what does it think about it, basically? Now you have, uh, the social theory of the church, starting with Leon the Thirteenth, Rerum Novarum, and going on with the present pope also, who, with due respect, I think as an Argentinian, <laughs> I mean, I think is a parodist in a way. <clears throat> so, the church for a long time have been trying to define what the good society is, and now they've changed. And now they don't impose, or it or she doesn't impose a way of thought, which was custom for a long time, uh, where people thought, people, ch churchmen, sorry, churchmen, kings, um, democracies, and so on, wanted you to think right, to think the proper thing, to be good. Uh, and they imposed on you. So before I speak about the social thought of the church, 
Let me give an example, because these vignettes really tell you something about it. Now, there was a, a Spanish Protestant called Servet who discovered the small circulation of blood and who was very extreme, uh, very extreme uh, Protestant who lived in Geneva. And Calvin didn't like him. So in the end, they punished him to be burnt at the stake. And this was Calvin at the stake. And they used green wood so it would take longer to burn. Now that sort of attitude, which is churchmen or kings or democrats tell us how to live, is going against my distinction. My distinction, I think, is very, very important. And not one that I've invented, but one which I said you will find in Hayek, among other things, when he speaks of continental reason. Now, I think that trying to say what the right wage is, and trying to say that people should treat their workers properly, uh, many of these things are absolutely acceptable, but not something which should uh, push away the, the free market and f liberty, not only in economics, but also in other things. I think it's a, it's a wrong thing to tell us what the good society is. That's not, that's not the business of the church. The business of churchmen is to tell you to, to how to be good, you, person, and how to do the right thing. Certainly not uh, have an organization that imposes virtue on you. That's, that's not something I can, uh, I can accept. And therefore, I think <clears throat> that when the church tries to define a philosophy of, social, of society, some of the things they say is absolute, are absolutely right. But other things, by limiting what the market can do, is wrong. I'll give a last thought. Um, how, how, uh, has, how is poverty displaced? How is poverty reduced? Now, the uh, General Secretary of the United Nations defined in the year 2000 the goals for the year 2000. And uh, in, the, in 2015, there should be fewer poor and so on. They confess that they had got their aims in 2013 because it's mainly free trade that has reduced the hunger of Indians and, and Chinese. Why, why do Chinese eat? Because within, within the limits of the Communist Party, and we don't know what bad they're going to do any day, um, they started trading trading with the rest of the world. And therefore, they started to eat. And also, the, the transformation of India, of the Republic of India, has been when they started allowing the market to work. All right, I agree, we should reduce the number of poor, but please do it the right way. Do it so that they are reduced properly. Questions? Any more questions? Mm. I know from, ah, there at the back. Uh, thank you again. Perhaps I could uh, swing the pendulum the other way then and take the objectivist approach, which is that virtue can only be self-defined rather than defined for you. Where do you stand on that within the framework of radical liberalism? Yeah, this is what Unreined uh, has defined. Um, I think it's not a very happy way to say that you should be selfish. And saying that liberalism is about selfishness, I think, goes against the theory of moral sentiments. And I think Adam Smith is a better leader than Anne Rain. And uh, therefore, of course, if you're telling people they should do their own thing as best they can without others interfering, that's all right, but why call this selfishness, for goodness sake? No, sometimes the right thing is not being selfish. I've given the example of Mother Teresa, could many other examples I could give. 
So I find it's unhappy. The, the results are good and people are, are led to do the right thing and they defend their view against <coughs> interfering bureaucrats uh, when they try to build a city, the architect that tries to build a city and so on. Uh, that's all right. But the philosophy is wrong, I think. The philosophy is wrong because you don't tell people that they are free when they are selfish. Perhaps the word is uh, sort of uh, making me dislike it, but that's it. Uh, I don't think it's right. And so I still think that what I've defended in the wake of Hayek, which is saying that reason is an institution, a perfectible institution that doesn't tell us what to do in life, and the distinction between what is um, <clears throat> what is the right and the wrong, uh, the right and the good, sorry, the right and the good, is something that I've discussed with followers of Anne Rain, and many of them I admire, certainly. But I think it's not the way, I don't think it's the way to bring humanity to our side by saying uh, normal human beings uh, interfere with people. Yeah, that's right, but shouldn't, they shouldn't interfere with people's plans. But I think we need a wider definition, and if I may say so, I think Adam Smith is a better teacher. One final question. No, final, why? Uh, uh, we, have, we, we, have to, we have to go... Uh, lunch. Yeah, lunch time. If we want to hear some interesting things about this place and Philip II. All right. <laughs> I will try to keep it very short, the question, although uh, I find it really complicated. Oh, you are? Yes, what's sorry. What's your name? Andras. Andras. I'm coming from Hungary. So. Uh, what, what I think is that liberalism, uh, politically, uh, is the, the biggest advantage of uh, liberalism is that, that it's easy to, easy to think that they are right about something. They, because it seems that they are on the right side. They have empathy, um, like um, equality. It, it sounds like a, a sympathetic thing uh, to the people. And I just read an article um, a year ago uh, with Sir Roger Scruton and uh, he said that uh, in order to understand when are the liberals wrong, uh, you have to read books. Uh, and it's hard work. To read? To read books. Books. Yeah. Uh, okay. and, it, and, it's, and it's hard work. Uh, and also, like, a personal example, uh, when I go into a debate uh, with, a young pe with young people, for example, about the gay marriage, uh, and personally, I'm against uh, gay marriage. Uh, it's it's really hard to win these debates because their arguments are very simple, right? Uh, two people love each other. Why shouldn't they get married? And on the other hand, the disapprovement of this it it it, it would be a complicated answer. Uh, so, so what I what I'm asking is that in the time uh, in in our ages uh, when we are getting our informations from Instagram, uh, from Facebook, which are just uh, 30 seconds. Uh, we read something and we, we understand it. We think we understand it. And on the other hand, to understand uh, conservatism, for example, it's a much more complicated thing. You have to read books. We heard that presentation uh, of yours. Uh, we got like five books to read. So it's a lot of time. So what, I, what I'm asking is, uh, that in this time, how could these ideas or how could these theories implemented in the new ages to the young people? Uh, because it's hard to understand that. I'm not sure that uh, they will take the time uh, to read books and not just using Instagram, Netflix, face, Facebook and stuff like that. To face uh, the question of gay marriage, as I said, the framework of what is right changes. And uh, we may be uh, against the liberation of the slaves at some point, or we may be for or against gay marriage. That is something that will have to be discovered as a long history. And maybe it's true that we should respect the institution of marriage so that we don't call marriage 
what, what isn't really between a man and a woman. And therefore, that is debatable. That is, the advance of the framework is something that is debatable. And now we're debating whether the great, uh, uh, the great companies of the internet are creating a monopoly and whether they should be, uh, they should be forced to accept, uh, to accept uh, voices that they don't agree with and so on. So there's been an opinion of Judge Thomas in, 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 on, on the Supreme Court saying that uh, the internet is like an hotel and therefore they should be made to accept whoever comes to the door and so on. So what I'm saying is you can defend an idea of marriage and it's not settled what we think is the right idea of marriage and that is something we can argue about. But still, the idea is that we have to have a framework of liberty to be able to cultivate our virtues. The second question is, people don't read. Well, some people do read, and in fact read too much, um, which is my case, because uh, I'm always a book in my hand, and um, maybe life is passing me aside. I, I have more confidence in the end in the good sense of ordinary people and uh, of common sense. So, yes, go on, uh, making people read, read yourselves, and I think in the end, hope for the best that common sense will prevail in the sense that, that we can observe what the free market does to society. And so one of the things we have to use is data, is how many poor have, uh, have stopped being poor? Something from 1976 to today, two and a half million poor uh, are now eat. And therefore, have a bit more confidence in your power of argument. Thank you, Professor. I think we can leave it here. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much.